Now in this epistle, I'm going over these things because it's very important to me that you see the flow of the the flow of the text. Paul has thoroughly accounted for our salvation. He's traced it back to before the foundation of the world. Amen. And with great expertise, he's told you that our salvation is associated with God's choice. Yeah. And with his determination to present a people without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He's related salvation to God predestinating us to be adopted. So you, when you think of salvation, you've got to tie all these things together. And not many people will help you in this. People argue about the things I've just talked about. People argue about it. When it actually is stated, I don't see how it could be stated any clearer. There's no, ex there's no excuse for confusion in the areas of God's choice and predestination. There's, it's just, it's just a sign of human stubbornness. That's all it is. It's not no excuse for it at all. God himself, has, he told us, has made us accepted in the Beloved, who is Jesus Christ. And he has announced that through Jesus we have redemption through his blood so that our past is covered and our debt is paid. Jesus did it. And it's, that's been according to the riches of God's grace. It's not because anyone asked him to do this. Let's be quite clear about this. No representatives of the human race asked God to do this. Yeah, that's right. I know David said, created me a clean heart, but he, he had the background of the promises and the yeah. law and the prophets. Yeah. And he's told us that in Christ we obtain an inheritance, and if you miss this inheritance, nothing else, <laughs> nothing else matters at all. And all of these involvements have been according to the riches of his grace. These, salvation is an expression of God's grace. That's what it is. And all of this is in order that we might be to the praise of his glory. And in the end, it, the Savior would be a trophy. So he's, to, he's told us, he's outlined all of this to us. And then he told us God sealed us with his Holy Spirit. So that angels, when they minister, know who's whose. Paul accounts for the experience of salvation in the second chapter by telling us God raised us from death and trespasses and sins. It was all of God he delivered us from the prince of the power of the air. It worked in us. And in the fourth chapter, he opens up what the body of Christ is and what it's for and where it's going. He has showed in the fifth chapter that God has structured social life to make it easier to understand these, yeah. the connection of people with God and people with Christ. Amen. So he structures social life so you can kind of learn about submission and acceptance and all this sort of thing. And where the church is headed is to grow up. What God intends for the church to do is to grow up in Christ, into Christ and all things. God has not even made it any provision for a church not to grow. He's not provided for that. There's, there's no room for that. So if that happens, that's the devil's work. That's not God's work. That's the devil's work. And as people have submitted to the flesh, not to the spirit, there's no such thing as a salvation where people don't grow. I'm sorry, there isn't. People think there is. It's just a delusion. And he's made all these things quite plain. Now he's, going, he's established, he's going to continue to develop that salvation from an experiential point of view is worked out in an intelligent arena, not in an emotional 
arena. There's certain things got to be understood, and understanding takes the precedence over feeling. It's stronger. Understanding's like the, like the bone in your arm, and emotions like the flesh. <laughs> you take the bone out, well, you know what happens. Emotion can't hold you up. So if you don't feel right, you just don't feel right. Well, that's that's very interesting, but you got to get something else than Amen. something other than that. Amen. All right now, he's. The apostle has positioned us, intellectually positioned us, so we can now we can get down to the matter at hand. Yeah. What's involved in living for God? Now, if we've not picked up on these other things that he said, what he's going to say now isn't going to mean a thing. That's why people neglect this text. It doesn't mean anything to them. There's a lot of people talk about it, but there's not many people like do it. Yeah. And the reason is they haven't picked up on the first five chapters. That's why. They've missed, maybe altogether, mm -hmm. that salvation is caused and maintained by deity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the only reason you're in is because God wanted you in. The only reason you're one is because he chose you to be one. The only reason you have a destiny is because he predestinated a destiny. See, what you've got to know all these things for this text that we're going to begin tonight. For this to mean anything, you've got to have a good grasp on those other things. Now, with that in mind, here's what we're going to do with verses 10 and 11. Finally... <clears throat> My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Finally. See? <laughs> now let's say you've read the first five chapters and the first part of the sixth chapter. It's possible to do that and you can't get the finally. If you not come up with the conclusion, I need strength, then you got to go back, and you got to get this. You got to get this from these other chapters, that what God requires of you means you got to have. You got to be strong. You you can't live for Christ and be weak. That's what all kind of people think you can. Occasionally, we have people that are weak. I can tolerate weakness for a while, but when it goes into years, it taxes my patience because something's wrong. Amen. I don't know what it is. I don't pretend to all, but I know something's not right. Somewhere that life is outside the circumference of salvation. Somewhere, somehow, they're living outside of where Christ put them. Yeah. Now, of course, the challenge is to uh, try to get assist people back into the circumference, but you can't do it by patting them on the back and crying. Yeah, that isn't the method Paul uses here either. Yeah. Finally, now he's spoken to individual groups. Wives and husbands, children, fathers, servants, masters. Now he's going to group them all together. Now we're going to talk about something common to all those groups. We're going to address the entire body of believers. We're not talking now about uh, wives, husbands, children, fathers, servants, masters. We're not talking at that level now anymore. We've addressed that already. Now we're talking at the common level, the body of Christ. This word, finally, that's a significant word. It's another one of those reasoning words, like wherefore and therefore. Remember, we've talked a lot about these reasoning words. Finally is one of them. 
The doctrinal sense of the word is that something needs to be said before we wrap this up. Something more needs to be said before we conclude. We can't stop with telling you just about how you function in the world. We're going to have to say a little more on this subject to put it together. To put it another way, the purpose of God presupposes that what he requires of us can only be carried out by the means he's going to specify now. Amen. That applies if you're a wife, a husband, a, a child, a father, a servant, or a master. Applies to all of them across the board. What God has told you must be done cannot be done with what he's going to talk about now. Finally. Now, five times Paul uses this word finally. It's like a, if you're talking in terms of accounting, it'd be the that grand total where the double line is. Grand total. Adds up to this. Yeah, are you able to uh, digest scripture and then add it up and come to a conclusion, so to speak? That's that's what he's doing here. Yeah. No, the, most people can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They really can't. That's why this is done for us. Yeah. Kind of teach us how to do it. Some people get all bogged down in the details. Get all bogged down in the details. Like a little child starts to look at the alphabet, and they're all enamored with a Q. Boy, they're just looking at that Q. And they don't ever do learn how to use the alphabet. Yeah, you'll learn it. You have children. You remember how they used to do this. So they have a box of toys. There's one that just one, one captures their attention. But this can't be this way in the body of Christ. In salvation, this can't be this way. You can't just fasten on something and just squat on there and, and let that bit dominate your... You've got to think in terms of where am I going? Yeah. What am I supposed to do? Overall, what am I supposed to do? This goes beyond wives will be your husbands. It includes that, but now it goes... You're going to go beyond that. Yeah. You're going to go beyond husbands love on their wives. You've got to do that, but you're going to go beyond... Yeah. You're going to go beyond children, obey your parents. You're going to go beyond fathers, raise your children. You're going to go beyond servants, obey your masters. Masters, treat your servants right. It's going to go beyond that. See, it's going to go beyond that. Because in order to do the smaller things, you've got to know the bigger things. That's the way the kingdom of God is. Now, the finally has been omitted in practically all modern day preaching. There's very little finalies. Very few conclusions. The conclusion is you ought to do it. That's, well, that's not the conclusion. The conclusion is how to do it. Or shall I say how it can be done. That would be a better way to say it. How it can be done. Too many people are left with the weight of requirement on them. See, Got the weight of the requirement on them but no reminder of how the will of God is actually done. Yes. That's what he's going to do here. Satan would love to, for us to be satisfied to know, just to know what we ought to do, and some people think that's, that's suffice. Well, I ought to, but you know how we are. We don't, and God's very understanding. He understands that we can't, and that's how people, they live with this. They live like this. And they think there's a virtue to knowing what you ought to be, and confessing that you're not what you ought to be. They think this like virtue is attached to that. That's right. Yeah, they seem to, seem to see what I hear is that if you can just make some kind of advancement in the things listed in chapter 5, yeah. if you can just make, then you can feel good about yourself. That's right. But that's not, that's that's not, not the it. end. No, no, it's not it at all. <laughs> now those who think of the way that I just described... We can say, as Paul said about another matter, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Amen. Yes. This way of thinking that didn't come from above. This wisdom did not come down from above. Finally, my brethren, now modern versions exclude that. That's not in any of your modern versions don't say, brother, my brethren. Even though it is in very reputable manuscripts, And is the weight of what Paul is saying. See, Paul is not writing as a dictator. He's writing as a brother. Amen. 
He's an apostle, but he's inside the body. So my brethren, this makes this is really the context in which he's right. I'm one of you. We're in the same body. He's a higher rank than we are, but in the same body. I'm writing as a member of the body, not as someone on the outside observing the body. Finally, brethren, <clears throat> it's like he's standing alongside of them. Be strong. Be, remember we talked about be, be versus do, right? <laughs> you don't do strong, you be strong. It's something you are. You either are strong or you are not. You're not like a little strong or half strong or a quarter strong. You're either strong or you're not. The word from heaven is be strong. Amen. Some versions say grow powerful. One version says be strengthened. Well, that really isn't what he says. Be strong is a result of being strengthened. It's not being strengthened. Receive your power. Draw your strength. Be empowered. See, in other words, it's a, it's, it's a little more difficult to explain be strong than what meets the eye. So you've got all these modifying clauses. But be strong has to do with what you end up being. He's not talking about the means to get there. He's already told you about the means, but he's not talking about how do you become strong. He says, now you, you be strong. And if you paid attention to what Paul said and you've grasped what he said, then this you pick this up right away. Be strong. That admonition is found three times in Paul's letters. Be strong. He mentions it in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be, he says, finally, be strong. In our text, finally, be strong. And to Timothy, be strong in the Lord. See, the life of faith requires strength. The kind of strength we're talking about here. Be strong. Elsewhere, he prayed that your eyes might be open to see the exceeding greatness of the power that's to usward who believe this. See, this is not easy to grasp. People don't find it so hard to explain why they're weak. But now, be strong. You say, I'm weak, I'm weak. All right. We understand those times, we understand. But here the shout comes from heaven, be strong. You never, you never hear God say, be weak. He'll never say that to you. Be vacillating. God will never say that. He'll never send angels out and say, make sure the people are unstable. The word from heaven is, be Strong. Say, well, I'm not strong. Then be strong. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> your faith didn't get hold of this. Amen. Amen. So this word comes from the apostle who also wrote to the Corinthians, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Then I'm strong. Yeah. There's a sense of which is a paradox, but the end result is to be strong. Mm -hmm. Be strong, that's right. Is that the same kind of word as uh, take up your bed and walk? Home? Yeah, be strong. Yeah, this, this word of... This exhortation to be strong is not only for it's not only for the weak, although we can't apply it in that sense, saying to the weak, be strong. Yeah. But it's also an exhortation to those who already are strong oh, yeah. Yeah, to there's... have more strength and maintain it. Yeah, no no one's excluded from this. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. This is this isn't addressed to the wives. Uh -huh. yeah. Just to be clear about it. This isn't addressed to the husbands. This is not addressed to the children as a group. It's not addressed to fathers or servants or masters. This is addressed to everybody in the body. Yeah. Amen. Here is God's word to you. Yeah. You have no alternative now. There's no alternative state you can be in. Mm -hmm. 
be strong. It was, see, no one will actually extend themselves in this area if they aren't convinced this is a requirement. God requires you to be strong. And what if I'm weak? Be strong. And Paul said, I, when I'm weak, he's, speak, he's speaking about it in, him, in his own strength he was weak. Then am I strong? So this is not human strength. This is not weightlifting. <laughs> it's not that sort of thing or counseling strength. Be strong. It's morally strong. It's strong, able to make a choice, able to stand, able to fight. Be strong. And then he adds, uh, incidentally, God is not glorified by weak Christians. This is no testimony to God's glory. Be strong in the Lord. Well, this is going to prove this is not, not as easy to explain as it may appear on the surface. Be strong in the Lord. Some versions read, "Be strong in the union in union with the Lord." That, that's not what it says. Be strong by the Lord. That's not what it says. And be strong from the Lord. That's not what it says. See, believers are depicted as being joined to the Lord and one spirit with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. The depiction of being with Christ, that's also in Scripture. It is. We are dead with Christ. We are crucified with Christ. We're quickened together with Christ and we're risen with Christ and our lives are hid with Christ in God. However, that is not what he's talking about here. The point here is being in. This is a more precise designation. With the Lord is more of a general designation. In other words, the Lord is the himself is the environment in which all these things are done. See, there's, a, there's a difference now in being around the Lord and being in the Lord. <laughs> it's the difference that was seen in the disciples before Christ was exalted and after they, he was exalted. See, they were with Christ <laughs> but after he was exalted, they were in Christ. Amen. It's all a difference in the world. In fact, salvation is calculated to bring you to grow up into Christ, not grow up till you're with Christ. He are with Christ from day one when you're converted. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you're not in Christ as as God intends. You got to grow up into Christ. We were baptized into Christ. Then we grow up into him in all things. Get deeper into him, so to speak. In, when we were saved, we were added to the Lord. Not to the number. They were added to the number of the body, but they were added to, they became part of him. They became part of him. They were in the Lord. The point here is not that we ourselves have strength and we're in the presence of the Lord because this isn't the case. As the disciples could tell you, we could be in the presence of the Lord and not be able to cast this demon out of this boy. His father brought to die. They were with the Lord, been with him for some for three years. Couldn't do it. With you got to see this difference between with and in. You got both of them true. Both of them, there's a perspective where both of them are absolutely true. But in the Lord, that's that's some, that's a deeper, deeper thing. I found it being in Christ is a very difficult thing to explain. In fact, you can only explain it satisfactorily to people who are in Amen. 
in the Lord. There's no variance between the Lord and them. Now, I'm not talking about the accomplishments. I'm talking about their perspective. They're in agreement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the Lord. It's something I want to emphasize. You grow up into him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or you partake of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's not like a, like a once-for-all fixed measure. It's, it's not like that. It's like you begin by being in the Lord, but it's on the edge yeah. of Canaan. It's like you're in Jericho. <laughs> And the whole land's out there before you. It's got to be occupied. You can't be strong on the edge. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to be clear about this. you got to move into the interior. Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. Now, God's strength was actually all around him, but when Israel got close to God, they didn't get strong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did they? No. See, there's a dear, Jesus, there was strength. He was strength all around. The devil could sense it. Strength all around him. But that didn't make the people strong that walked close. He walked real close to Jesus. You didn't get strong. <laughs> that's not the way it worked by the power of his might his might is released from the inside Amen. if you're not in Christ you don't even have access to the power and that's the kind of power that's going to make you strong be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might now that power is only operable within the framework of God's purpose that is, resides in Christ Jesus. He put his purpose in, in Christ. So the only way you have any understanding of God's purpose is if you're in the Lord. Because that's where everything was. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid with, with Christ. They're in his position. Power of his might. The strength that is realized in the power of his might is only operable when you do what God has purposed to be done. Like you can't tamp into this power for personal, yeah. Amen. for your personal yeah. agenda. Uh -huh. yes. That's why sometimes God's people know that God can do anything. So you may have a bum car, and I've, I think I've done it myself, pray that God would heal my car well, see, that would be an erroneous prayer unless my car was used exclusively for him. Then, all right, then I could, I could kind of see that, although I wouldn't recommend it. You, this is like a rabbit trail. I would recommend that you not think of God's power mm -hmm. in connection with your personal agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. You may think it's a good agenda. You may think it's a very good purpose, but it's really best... To think of God's power in association with his revealed, what he has said is his purpose. In the power of his might. If Jesus only used his might to do the Father's will, what makes anyone think that they could use it for their own will? Yeah. Yes. Well, this goes back to what you said at the beginning. Where they might just grab a hold of something in this, and they don't get the whole picture. I remember when I was little... We uh, ran out of gas, and I was praying for the Lord to help us. And my dad said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm praying for the Lord to help us. And he said, we're only right down the street from the house. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> I was just a little kid. I didn't understand that. But see, yeah. when you're little, you don't get the whole picture. Some people just don't get the whole picture of what the Lord's doing. So yeah. they pray small. See, in today's Christian culture, very, 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 Few people think of what God is doing. Very little preaching about this. It's generally about what you're doing, how God wants to help you, and so forth. But this thing is really about what God's doing, and He may, He has made this clear in this in this letter. He made this so clear, like you have to be like an idiot 
not to pick up on it. Because it's God, God, Christ, Christ, all the way up to, a, to chapter 4. <laughs> then he brings you into the picture. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You might say, so that you can put on the whole armor of God. <clears throat> put on. Put it on. Some versions say, take it up. There it is, take it up. Clothe yourselves with it. Wear it. Take it. So the armor of God, God doesn't put it on you. He crucifies the old man, but you got to put on the new man. Ah. Of old time under the law, the work of the priest required that he put on certain clothes. Before he went about his work, he had to put these high priestly clothes on. Yeah. And they were elaborate. Yeah. Yeah. Out there in that desert, they were undergarments and outer garments and leggings and robes and breastplates and a helmet and a, a miter. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he couldn't do the high priest work until he put on those high priestly clothes. So in living under him who died for us and rose again, there's certain attire is required. Amen. This isn't all of it what we're going to read about, but this is one of the some of the key things that have to be put on. We're told for we are told for instance, you put on Christ. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There it is. Or he admonished us, put on the new man, or as the elect of God, put on bowels of mercy and so forth. See, the certain things have to be put on before you can even begin to work or live for God. Certain things have to be put on. But it shouldn't surprise you that there are no small number of people trying to do what God wants them to do, and they haven't put on what God told them to put on. Spiritual life is structured so the godly advantage can't be realized unless you are involved. Yeah, you just don't go stand in the reign of God's grace and get, get a good saturation of grace and just stand. That's not the way this works. You've got to become involved. And again, that's why focus is so critical because if you're not careful... You, will, you can condition your heart and mind to be drawn aside by personal interests. Oh, yes. And that can come in a lot of forms. It can mm -hmm. come through covetousness. It can come from anxiety. It can come from fear. But whenever your attention is drawn yeah. inward, now there's no power. Yeah. There isn't any power available. That's that's part of being strong in the Lord. Is main to, your, your primary ambitions are His ambitions. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then, you, then, then the power is given to you to support Amen. you. See, this is why believers have to be careful about their associations Amen. and their preferences. Amen. Yeah. One of the primary purposes of the people of God meeting together, and they that fear the Lord spake often one with another, is to keep a, a perspective alive that's right. Amen. Yeah. But let's say that you elect to gather somewhere with God's people once a week. But you've gathered with the world at least five times a week on your work and every day in your shopping, and you live in a neighborhood with them. Do you really think, do you really think that that one bit of contact can, out, contact can outweigh all those other influences that are all self-centered, unless there's some believers there, they're all self-centered, and you're under this, you're submitted to this kind of mentality. And it's one of the chief reasons for the people of God loving one another and choosing to be with one another as frequently as is possible and practical is to keep their perceptions alive and well. Amen. Spiritual life is stru structured so that you can't take advantage of it without being involved in it. And involvement cannot be sporadic. I mean, you'll learn this by experience, but I'm, I'm telling you, but your experience will teach you this. See, these days there are people that are attracted to religion 
that has minimal requirements. They may not actually say this, but they say, what is the least that I have to do, all right? Salvation doesn't have any minimal requirements. There aren't any. Amen. And people think they're, they're just wrong. That's all there is to it. Yeah. God has not made arrangements for you to receive a tenth of the great salvation. Yeah. Or 25% or even 75%. You either take it all or you get none. Amen. Amen. Now, this is how it is now. I'm telling you the truth. When Jesus was among a lame man and he healed him, it was expected he would pick up his bed. He got to be involved. He begged that he'd pick up his bed and walk. He got involved. Yeah. And he told a blind man, he had to go wash at the pool of Siloam. He had to get, get involved. What was doing? In the land of the withered hand, he had to become involved, stretch it out. This is salvation. This is what God does in salvation. He involves his people. Yeah, amen. And that involvement requires be strong in the Lord and to put on amen. what we're going to talk about now, put on the whole armor of God. Is that only strong people can put on this armor. That's right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Brother Gibbon? Yes. I was also thinking of those, the, the, those examples you just used. They were also done in faith. And without faith, it's impossible, impossible. to please God. And faith yeah. is not yeah. slack or lazy at all. It, it, Amen. It's robust. <laughs> you may have learned this early on. I, I did learn it relatively early in my life of faith that God doesn't accept partial commitment and partial dedication. But it, it, it become clearer to me as I, but I kind of sensed it, but it, this thing grew on me. He doesn't, he doesn't really accept it. And there's a lot of people that that's all they're willing to give. Some, they give some, they give some of their life I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry either. I'm just being polite. God will not accept part of your life. And he'll not give you part of Christ's life. To get all of Christ, you've got to forfeit all of self. Put on now the whole... Some verses read, put on all, put on the complete armor, put on everything. The word whole means full or complete. So he doesn't set the armor out before you. He says, now pick out what you think you need the most. You've got to put it all on. Put on the whole armor. Full or complete. Of old time when they talked about the whole congregation, Exodus 16, 2, it was everybody. When he talked about a whole ram being offered, it's a whole bone off, burn offer, you burn the whole ram, not just part of it. When Joshua took the whole land, he took all of it. <laughs> when God sanctifies the people wholly, there is no part that's not sanctified. Spirit, soul, body. That's all your, essentially all your person. Now it's a principle in the kingdom of God that what God gives has to be received in its entirety. This ranges from Christ. You've received Christ. You can't receive him partially. It's salvation. You can't receive it partially. The faith that comes from him, you can't receive it partially. The grace that see, you you have to receive the whole thing. I understand now that learning about it and utilizing it, that's growth is involved here, but you have to receive the whole thing. You have to put on the whole thing. Um, I was also thinking, almost all, when you come into Christ, all of the old man is crucified. Yeah, that's right. That's you know, right. He doesn't give you part of the new man. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right, Sister Mariah. Mm -hmm. When you come to the Lord, mm -hmm. here's what he requires. Do you love him with 
all of your heart, uh, all the understanding, all the soul, and all the strength. This is just how the this is how God is. You have to give Him your all to receive His all. That's the that's the way it is. Now the scriptures speak of the plenitude that God gives. We're not talking about a little package here. Like it speaks about all spiritual blessings, all things that pertain to to life and godliness. I'm, now, the point I'm making here is that to receive this, you got to you got to take the whole package. You can't take part of it. I understand it's, it's your your understanding sort of measures. It. I understand that, but you've got to be all of it's what you must take. It takes of all joy and peace, all grace, and being filled with all the fullness of God, being filled with all knowledge. All things becoming new. See, this is how God deals. He deals with the whole. Now, brethren, this is the secret to spiritual growth and establishment. It's getting out of the detailed level and into the all. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's the secret. But invariably, men think, y'all receive it all if I get if I work at the detail level. Mm -hmm. No, this is this is the secret is to think in the terms of the all. Put on all the armor of God, the whole armor of God. We read in Scripture about the fullness of the blessing, or the fullness of him that fills all in all, or the fullness of God, or the fullness of Christ. See, owing to doctrinal corruption, the modern Christian has no clear idea of what's been provided in salvation. They really don't. It's all. So put on the whole, the whole what? The whole armor of God. That is, this is armor that God alone provides. It's of being source, source of him. Belongs to him and he, he provides it, gives it. He does it through Christ and by the Holy Spirit, but he, it's, it's the armor he provides. So you're never asked to put on the whole armor of psychiatry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, put on the whole armor of the sectarian creed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh the whole armor of God. Yeah, that's what. Why? Because what God's calling you to do now mm -hmm. requires this all this armor. You'll not be able to do what He requires you to do if you don't do this. Armor, by definition, is a, is a complete set of instruments used in defense or offense with the emphasis upon defensive armament. Whole armor is translated from one word, and that's what it means. The words of God means it's supplied by God, appropriated from him through Christ and by the Spirit. When you come into Christ, God doesn't put this on you. He commissions you. He provides it for you, Amen. but you have to put it on. Yeah. You have to have faith. As Sister Nikki said, you have to have faith to do this. You have to have faith to believe there really is armor. Amen. Amen. Putting on the armor of God is Abraham and Sarah proceeding to go through what is necessary to have a child, even yeah. though they weren't biologically capable of doing it. That's the same type of thing we're talking about here. Yes. Put on the whole armor of God. Put it on. When Israel came into Canaan, he gave them the land, but they had to take it <laughs> and drive out the inhabitants. They had to put it on, so to, so to speak. In Christ, you're positioned where the armor is, and faith brings it within your reach, uh, but you've got to put it on. Moses had a rod, but he had to put it in his hand and use it. And Samson, he had a jawbone of an ass, but he had to use it or put it on, so to speak. <coughs> God provides it, but you must put it on. God makes it effective when you do put it on. Amen. 
It's not effective laying down there by your side. Amen. Armor won't protect you if it's not on you. Yeah, that's right. Won't do it. Mm -hmm. This is a complete set of armor that must be taken hold of us. You can't take, you don't put it on piece by piece. Yeah. You put all the whole armor on. I understand you may say, you may, you may go through the mechanism, but put it on the belt and put it, I understand, but it's not really considered put on until it's all on. Put on the whole armor of God. Or why, Paul, why should we put on the whole armor of God? It almost sounds like we're in danger. I've read where you're able to keep us from falling, that nobody can pluck us out of your hand. Now, how come we have to have our whole armor? Armor sounds like we're in a battle of some kind. Well, you're getting it now. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is the purpose now for putting it on, which is the is where your life has been leading up. You God's been culturing you, leading you up to the point where you see it, well, there's going to be some things I have to do. If I have to think in terms of I'm a wife, I'm a husband, I'm a child, I'm a servant. I'm a father, I'm a master. If you have to think at that level, well, however, but in the doing of whatever you're doing for God, you got to have this armor. Amen. Amen. So you may be able. Now, it's true that God is our buckler, and Jesus is our advocate, and Jesus is our intercessor, and the Spirit dwells within. That's all true. So someone might say, there you are. No question about it. Will we be protected? Nothing's able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so a person takes an overly simplistic view of this. Put on the whole armor of God. So you'll be able to fight, to stand. Oh. Huh. So you're able to be a pioneer, so you're able to stand. Amen. Now there's pretty, several places in Scripture that tell us to stand, and stand fast, that's to stay put. Don't lose any ground. Sometimes it'll take everything you've got just to hold your position. You're not going to be able to make any significant advance. There's times like that. Evil day is called the evil day. And you've got to stand in that evil day. You can't. See, some people's trials knock them down. Sometimes I can see it in their face. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. They've been knocked down. You don't have to be knocked down. Amen. Well, there's a sense in which you are, but you get up again. Yeah. We're knocked down, but not knocked out. Mm -hmm. Cast down, we're not destroyed, as the scripture says. You don't have, but if you're knocked down, at least fall forward. Amen. Pick up a little ground. Yeah. Don't, 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 go well, backwards. See, there's a lot of people don't think this is necessary. There are some people I know that a short time ago they were stronger than they are now. They were more capable than they are now. They were more determined than they are now. What's happened? They didn't put on this armor. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Now you can provide all the explanations you want, all the fancy explanations you want, but if they weren't able to stand, they didn't put on the armor. Amen. Put on all the armor. So you'll be able to stand. So if your name's Job, mm -hmm. you'll not lose your integrity and you'll not sin against God no matter what you go through it. Will you will not do it. Amen. Stand against what? The wiles. The wiles of the devil. Some versions say the schemes of the devil. The deceits of the evil one. Deceptive tactics of the adversary. The artifices of the devil. The assaults of the devil. 
the devil's strategies. The word wiles means, as used here, cunning arts, deceit, craft, trickery. In the English, the English word wiles means a trick or stratagem intended to ensnare or deceive. Also, a beguiling or playful trick. And here, skill in outwitting. The wiles of the devil and the wiles of the devil, if you do not stand, he'll outwit you. Yes. <laughs> His strategy will overcome yeah. your determination. Mm -hmm. If you don't have this armor on, if you've not put on the whole armor of God, see, we're not talking about resisting <clears throat> Satan's illness mm -hmm. or poverty or something like that. It's his deception. Yeah, He'll try and come to you and sell you a bill of goods that will make that will loosen your grip yeah. on eternal life. Yeah, See? Only the whole armor of God can protect you. Yeah. He's that he's that crafty. Mm -hmm. He'll outwit you. He will outwit you. If you don't have on the whole armor of God, he'll out outwit you, outfox you, mm -hmm. and he'll tie you up in knots. Mm -hmm. And you may come and cry and tell the brethren how bad it is and you didn't know why this happened and just be quiet and put on the whole armor. Mm -hmm. You got in that mess because you didn't have the armor on. Either that or the armor is ineffective. Yeah, yeah. I'm not about to say that this armor is not effective. Mm -hmm. So if Satan fools me mm -hmm. or sidetracks me or outwits me, <laughs> it's not because of any defect in the armor. It's because I didn't put it on. Amen. See, Satan's able to produce, he's able to produce disturbance in a person's life. He can do this. In his initial attack against Job, he moved the Sabians to take Job's oxen and asses and kill all his servants, all the servants caring for them but one. I'm telling you what Satan could do. He moved the Chaldeans, he moved fire to fall from heaven, burn up all his sheep and the servants keeping them, except for one. He moved the Chaldeans to take all of his camels and kill the servants that kept them all but one. He caused a great wind to come from the wilderness and strike the house where his children were, and it fell down and killed all his children. See, so he got, <laughs> Satan can call this, cause disturbance, make no mistake about that. But that's not what we're talking about here. You can handle that without Jesus. Job did. Job did. But what we're talking about is of another order. Give us another, it's of another rank. It's something that will make a person deny the faith or leave their first love or forsake the Lord or... <laughs> How are you going to be able to avoid something like that? Because Satan can make Demas yeah. forsake the work That's right. and be attracted by the world. Yeah. How do you avoid that? You've got to put on the whole armor. Amen. 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 That's, that's the thing. This is the uniqueness of our fight. See, under normal circumstances, when you fight, you're not doing anything else. In a, in a conventional battle, you're just fighting as a soldier. But yeah. in Christ, that's not all you're doing. That's right. See, you're... You're, you're working heartily as unto the Lord, yep. and you have these particular stewardships that you're not going to be distracted yep. from, and all the different stewardships that God gave you, as well as this fight. See, the purpose of the wicked one is to turn you away from the work of the Lord. That's right. Yeah. That's what that's what that's is right. targeted to do. And so yeah, you've got yeah. to be able to have the armor on so you're not distracted every time some difficulty happens. You're that's not distracted right. from preeminently working for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, let's take these different classes of people that Paul has mentioned. Let's, let's take, for instance, the wives. So they live with their husbands emulating Christ in the church. They do it as unto the Lord. But do you think that Satan doesn't come to their house? Do you think Satan doesn't try and approach them while they're in the act of serving God? Well, you're a husband. You're caring for your wife. You're loving her as Christ of the church. Do you think that Satan, while you're doing that, Satan goes away? 
and decides he won't bother you anymore? Do you think if you're a child, you're obeying your parents? Do you think that Satan doesn't try and work while you're obeying your parents? Or a servant or a master? See? <coughs> Satan's wiles, as Brother Ricky said, are going on while you are engaged in the work of the Lord. Amen. It is true that Satan cannot subvert you. He, he cannot separate you from the love of God. But he can be in the same vicinity where you are and be shouting at you and calling at you, trying to distract you and turn you aside by subtlety. He may sin. Say you're a prophet. And God told you, don't stop, go straight home. And some other fan comes and says, I'm a prophet too, and God told me to tell you to come into my house. And that's, that prophet was killed, you know. Yeah, right. Don't think that this can't happen to you. Uh -huh. That while you're doing the work of the Lord, it's, it's while they were doing the work of the Lord, the demons got off the boat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Subtlety, his craftiness. Look at the brother who's writing this letter to us. <laughs> yes, right. Stoned yeah. and left out of Lystra for dead. That's right. This yeah. wasn't the only time he was stoned. That's right. He was rotted. He was rejected by his brothers in, in, in a lot of different cases That's by, right. by, by those of, of Jewry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, he faced all manner of difficulty. Yeah. And yet, he said, I count my life not as dear to myself, right. and I might finish my course. He wasn't thinking about yeah. just surviving the battle. Yeah. He was thinking about finishing what God gave him to do. Amen. Amen. Let's say you, you come into the... Uh, assembly you're, or you're with some kindred spirits you're talking about the things of the Lord about the time you think I'm insulated now Satan will throw right during the Lord's table here comes this flaming arrow he'll try and divert your attention how are you going to how are you going to offset it you got to put on the whole armor Amen. of God. Amen. You have to stand at the Lord's table, too. Amen. You have to stand in the assembly as well as on the job and in the world. You have to stand all these places Amen. because at every place you are, Satan, you're within access of Satan, his fiery darts. Amen. He's going to try and lure you out yeah. of the safety zone, so to speak. Amen. Now, Satan doesn't come and say, could you just take that armor off? Yeah. That is how he does it. He's wily. So he's going to get you distracted because you only have the armor on while you're in Christ. That's right. See? Amen. Mm -hmm. Wiles of the devil. Mm. Satan's <coughs> strategies are designed to move us backwards. See? Yes. If he gets us in a backward, pedaling backwards, so to speak, mm -hmm. he's got you. That's why our weaponry is designed to make us stand. Mm -hmm. There's not, none of it for the back, you'll notice. Yeah, that's right. You'll notice that we go through the armor. There's no armor for the back. Your back's uncovered. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're not going to run. Now, that's why. It sounds like putting on the armor is not a one-time process. No, sir. It's not. <laughs> it's not. Mm. I gather it's a daily. It's a, it's, as soon as you're... When you go to sleep, mm -hmm. you're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You teach our little children to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Yeah. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Yeah. Good theology. Mm -hmm. When you wake up, yeah. you got to put on the armor. Yeah. Put on the whole armor. You can, and when you sleep, you should commit the keeping of your soul to God while you're asleep because he can throw all kind of ideas in your mind. Right. Oh, yeah, some of us have had some experience here. Throw a come form of dreams and ideas, and you think, wow, how in the world could I have dreamed such a thing as that? Uh -huh. that, was, uh, that was your enemy. Uh -huh. But if you commit the keeping of your soul to God, when you go to sleep, you commit yourself to him, uh -huh. he'll protect you. But when you're conscious... And I'm, I'm assuming, as Brother Bob said, this is a daily activity. You put on the whole armor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For you venture into the activities of life, yeah. Yeah. you put on all the armor and hold your ground. Amen. To 
determined I'm not going to go back. Tonight when I come home, I'm not going to know less than when I left, and I'm not going to be further from God than I was when I left. Make that determination. Put on the whole armor of God. But you put it on by faith, and you'll be able to stand against the wiles, trickery. I don't think some people think of Satan as, uh, in terms of wiles or deception or deceit. They think in terms of physical occurrences. And while Satan can do that, to be sure, it's his deception that is a dangerous thing. Amen. <laughs> Do any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? We were speaking of putting on the whole armor of God. I thought the armor of God is inseparable. You can't have one without the other. It's like they're, um, they're complementary to each other. You can't have your loins good about with truth without having the helmet of salvation. Mm -hmm. You can't have the breastplate of righteousness mm -hmm. without having the shield of faith. I mean, if, if we don't take the whole thing, then <coughs> we can't take anything at That's all. That's exactly right. You're exactly right. For the Aaron? The good fight of faith is one battle that your main objective is not to defeat the enemy. That's right. The, the, uh -huh. enemy, the good. enemy is actually incidental. Mm -hmm. The nature of the fight is, is to lay hold of the kingdom, mm -hmm. and the good fight of faith comes like in root. So the objective is to make it to glory, to, to be accepted of the Lord, to seek after the Lord, and, and fighting is in order to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's there's been there is some confusion in the religious world about like taking on the devil. Mm -hmm. and if, yes. He, if if his person and his activity become the focus, he actually has the advantage. Yeah. Right. Amen. Well said. Amen. Yes, Sister Barbara? When considering giving all unto the Lord, I thought about a precedent that was set back in the book of Acts that I think I misunderstood for a while is that of Ananias and Sapphira. Yes, amen. Whenever, whenever the apostle told him, while it was still in your hand, mm -hmm. it was yours to do, I, I think I had thought at one point, well, if they had decided that they were just going to give, you know, if they, if they told the church and the apostles that it was just a portion of what they sold the land for, then it might have been accepted, but I don't think that was the case because it was being offered to the Lord. And if they were going to offer it to the Lord, then it was going to be offered in totality. Very good. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, for this text and for the challenge that it issues to us to put on the whole armor of God. And we do ask for grace and for faith to enable us to do this regularly so that at no time during our conscious lives, at no time will we be without the armor. We commit ourselves into your care in Jesus' name. Amen.